Hey guys, TiVo here and welcome back to another episode of the Crypto Rundown. Once again, another wild week in the crypto markets, both in the charts and in the news. Brendan, what do you have for us? Yeah, that's right, TiVo. The crypto space continues to impress. We had Bitcoin recontesting the $70,000 zone, approaching those all-time highs pretty fast. There's a lot of choppiness. There's a lot of volatility. We're going to make sure that we break it down in today's episode, as well as the catalysts that are contributing to all of this. You know, we take a look at the Ethereum ETF outflows. We take a look at what's happening with NASDAQ and all these other outside factors, as well as some of the spaces that are shining. You know, two in particular that we're going to mention is the RWA and tokenization space, but also the Solana ecosystem as they have a lot of metrics coming out. Absolutely. And you showed us a couple altcoins that have been ripping that we've been talking about on this program for the last couple of months. And finally, the Bitcoin Nashville conference was this weekend. Star-studded guests that we prepped you for last week and none other than Donald Trump was the keynote speaker on Saturday. We have the best of the best clips. You can hear it from the horse's mouth yourself. We go over the, uh, the talking points that he did and the conference as a whole. Guys, the timestamps are below so you can watch what you want to watch when you want to watch it please like subscribe drop a comment and thanks for watching ladies and gentlemen welcome back to the crypto market rundown where we talk about everything that's happening in the world of cryptocurrency from the fundamental in the news to the technicals on the charts we spend the time doing hours of research so that you all don't have to and yet another action-packed week here in crypto tivo all sorts of stuff happening. Can't wait to dive on into it all. But how are, how are you feeling on your end? Feeling good. Uh, enjoying the summer. I think it was, uh, you know, it's always good to kind of take a step back. We're, we're in this every week, spreading the good word of crypto, breaking down the news, and always trying to, I think, put a positive spin on it. Um, but yeah, zoom out. Markets have been sideways. You know, we've seen some breaks to the upside. We've seen some breaks to the downside. But, you know, just got to focus on keeping a steady head and uh, looking at things with even keeled. And I had a nice week at the, uh, even though we did record the episode last week with Bryce, I was at the beach with my family. So always, always, uh, you know, good to, to do a little reset, but eyeing up the fall or the, the end of summer here in the fall. And, and there's a lot of momentum, like we've been talking about all summer long. So excited to dive into it. Yeah. I mean, let's just take a look at what's happening at a very high level overview right now. I mean, Bitcoin just hit it, or rather recontested $70,000. Uh, it's all-time high and cycle highs, right around $74,000. So it's pushing back up into the highs, saw a little bit of a rejection. We had the Bitcoin conference last week. Trump was speaking there, RFK Jr., all these other financial figures. Uh, we've seen a lot of volatility. Solana continues to just impress us as we're going to take a look at. The Ethereum ETFs are going wild still, even uh, about a week after the launch here. And just stuff continues to happen. So if you're tuning in here saying, have I really missed anything? The answer is you probably have. <laughs> and that's why we <laughs> love doing these episodes. Uh, it's because seriously, there is so much to talk about, so much to unpack. And we're excited to talk about how this can affect the market as well. So let's kick things off with Bitcoin first. What in the world is happening here? Because as we saw last week, Bitcoin rose up to around $70,000, tapped this level almost to a T, and then saw a very swift rejection. Now, as we're going to show the charts in just a second here, you know, it's important to note that whenever anything is getting up close to its all time high, it's going to have resistance levels. And we've seen Bitcoin struggle at this level countless times um, in the last several months, about five times to be exact. So as we flash up the Bitcoin chart on the screen here, I just want everyone to understand um, that this is a level that we have certainly been around quite a bit over the last several months. We can see that we retested this area um, around March, and then we did it again in April, and then we did it again for a second time in April. Then we came back in May and June, and here we are in July, inching our way back up into this very same zone. So you can see that this has been, you know, historically speaking, a pretty consistent resistance zone for Bitcoin. Now, what are the catalysts that are kind of causing us to have a hiccup here? You know, that seems to be everyone's question. Why are we not at new all-time highs yet? And I think that there's a couple of catalysts that are contributing to this. I think one of the big ones that I've seen is just all the FUD that's circulating around. You know, we used to have Germany that was going to offload a bunch of Bitcoin. Then it was the US. Then it was Mt. Gox. Then it was, you know, negative regulation and this and that. 
And there's all these like essentially FUD articles saying, uh oh, the price of Bitcoin might go down. You know, something might happen to it. And all of that has just been washed away. Bitcoin is retesting the highs despite all of this. It feels like the bears are really trying to throw everything that they can at Bitcoin. And it just doesn't matter. So besides this, I think another really big factor is what's happening to major indices like NASDAQ. Uh, if we take a look at what's been happening with NASDAQ over here, this thing has been getting clobbered. Now, you're probably asking yourself, We're, you know, Brendan, why does this matter, right? This is the crypto market. It's not the stock market. It's not the traditional market. Why does NASDAQ matter here? And because what this does is this makes people want to be, specifically NASDAQ represents the tech sector, it makes people want to be a little bit more risk off when there is periods of, of high volatility. And that's exactly what we're seeing here as since around July 11th, we saw NASDAQ drop almost 11% to the downside in about a two-week window. Now for the crypto markets, we do that in a day, right? We don't think twice about a 10, 11% move. But in something that's as big as NASDAQ, uh, that's a big one. That's a big one. I mean, you see stocks now getting hit 20, 30%, some 40, some more than that. And it's been a pretty nasty time over here. So I think this has made investors a little bit more hesitant towards going um, to a riskier approach here. And I think we've just seen a glimmer of that kind of peak and, and show its face in the crypto space as well. Now, the last thing that I want to talk about is the Ethereum outflows. We're going to save that for a little bit later. We have a whole segment on Ethereum. There's a lot to unpack there. <clears throat> but we are seeing hundreds of millions of dollars in outflows from, you guessed it, Grayscale. Again, we're going to save that for a later segment here. I kind of want to run through the high level of uh, the crypto markets. But a cool thing that we have seen here is that Bitcoin dominance, and I guess it's cool depending on who you are and what side you're on, but Bitcoin dominance has hit a new all time or not a new all time, a new multi year high. Uh, we just saw Bitcoin dominance hit its highest level that we have seen since April of 2021. And there's a little cool chart over here from the block that shows us this. But this is like, seriously, I mean, it's a big milestone. The last time that we saw Bitcoin dominance this high was in 2021. And with it kind of approaching and pushing up into almost around the 58% area, what this means is that altcoins are getting outperformed by Bitcoin still. Um, altcoins aren't doing anything too crazy. We have a lot of the large caps that are still doing good. When we take a look at Bitcoin, when we take a look at Ethereum, when we take a look uh, at even Solana, all of these are actually doing quite well. Um, but once we start getting more into the traditional altcoin market, they're still going sideways. Again, are they doing awful? No. Are they doing amazing? Not really either. They're kind of just moving sideways. A lot of them look like they might have found some sort of bottom. But when we look at the Bitcoin dominance chart over here, this is what we're referencing. This thing has just been on this continued upside move for a long time now. You can see on this, you know, the chart that I have on the screen here that, you know, we're moving up and then we're pulling back five, six, seven percent. Then we're moving up pull back, up, pull back. And Bitcoin dominance has actually been the most sideways that it's been since this run has really started. You can see it had this steep recovery from 38% all the way up into the mid 50s. And now we've been going sideways for a little bit. But Bitcoin dominance continues to go higher, which just means that um, Bitcoin is outperforming a lot of altcoins. And the large caps continue to be some of the better performers. You know, they're seeing solid up days and uh, minimal retracements when the market is selling off, which is something to kind of note over here. Now, I think that there are a couple of, uh, of exceptions to this rule. Um, I think that we have the RWA space, real world assets and tokenization. I think that's one. It's been an outlier to me. Um, and a couple of the tokens that have stood out here have been things like Ondo and Maker and Goldfinch and Maple, which have been you know relatively good when looking at a lot of the other altcoins uh, at the moment. The other one is the Solana ecosystem, which we're going to dive into a little bit more uh, in just a second. But essentially what's happening here with Solana is Solana is, is breaking out to new local highs. It's trying to recontest its cycle highs. And the, the price action has actually been really good. And it's been one of those things where it's more than just Solana. It's the Solana ecosystem. 
right? We look at some of the decentralized exchanges or the projects that are built on Solana, and they're doing pretty good as well. Uh, some of the notable ones over here are Jupiter and Radium, which have gone on some pretty solid runs here in recent weeks. I mean, Jupiter in the last, what is this, in the last about month or so, it's up about 70%. In the last month or so for uh Jupiter, it's up about 66%. So Radium up about 70, Jupiter up about 65. Um, and these are two other projects that are doing, you know, quite a well or quite well. When we're looking at the rest of the Solana ecosystem, um, another really cool article that I've seen floating around here. And, you know, one of the things that we talked about a little bit on here is just the sheer amount of, of volume and activity that is coming through the Solana ecosystem. Yeah, and I totally see the point of talking about those other coins. And you know, even though the si the sideways market, as we've seen it recently, you just pointed out a couple good projects that have had some price action. I think we got to give uh, Maple the Crypto One Hundred One uh, bounce. We call it because uh, they were just on the pod. Uh, we recorded a, two, a week or two ago and it aired on Tuesday. So that project's been doing good. I think um, this week Centrifuge has had a good week. So, you know, there's always there's always something, you know, going on. And, and yes, yeah, Solana kind of has a, a strength to it. Um, obviously, Ethereum leading up to the ETF. So there, there's a lot of interesting stuff under the hood um, that you can kind of just check out when, when things are sideways. Yeah, I, I, again, Solana continues to amaze me here, Tivo. Um, we looked at some pretty wild charts last week when it was talking about transaction count. And coincidentally enough, the block, who I love using for data, not sponsored by them or anything, but I think that they do a good job. Um, they published this article here that we have on the screen talking about how Solana DEXs and the Solana DEX ecosystem may be outpacing Ethereum in terms of trading activity. And they go through a lot of these different metrics here saying, hey, the Solana DEX volume um, continues to increase. They're having a rise in weekly active addresses. They now have hit 2 million and these trends continue to go up. You know, One of the things that they reference here is the Solana Ethereum DEX volume ratio, which compares the Solana DEX volume versus the Ethereum DEX volume and this thing hit a new all-time high, which means that Solana was outperforming the Ethereum DEXs or Solana DEXs were outperforming the Ethereum decentralized exchanges at a rate of which they've never done before. It was a uh, ratio of 136%. And if we kind of scroll down to the chart over here, we can see this. I mean, it's wild. And this raises a lot of questions because, you know, Radium and a couple of these other ones that we briefly mentioned when we were looking at the charts... Uh, now what we're seeing is that Solana has more transactions. It's now having higher DEX volume. They have this insane amount of user base and they're having a drastic increase in trading activity. And I think that there's an argument to be made here. And this is going to be a bold claim. Not everyone's going to agree with me here. And I think that's okay with it. But it's, you know, my truthful thoughts is that if we look at something like Solana, which is th about three, three and a half percent of the crypto's market cap, and it is outpacing Ethereum and Bitcoin when it comes to some of these metrics. Um, does it really deserve to be 3% of the crypto's market cap if it's outperforming the cryptos that, the, that are the vast majority of it? I think Bitcoin is you know, 57, 58%. I think Ethereum was closer to like 13, 14, 15, maybe somewhere around there, maybe a little bit more. Um, but then there's Solana at 3%. And if we look at even Ethereum's main DEXs like Uniswap, you know, it's the big kind of a uh, tool that we compare everything else because for the longest time it, it has been the largest and the most successful decentralized exchange. I mean, uh, Uniswap, I think has a six and a half billion dollar market cap. And then you look at Radium, which we're referencing in this report to outperform it, Uniswap, yet it only has a 10th of the market cap or something like that, like a 600, 650 million dollar market cap. Um, yet it's outperforming this one that has, that is six, you know, substantially larger. So I think there's something to say about Uniswap, right? It's been around for a long time. It's been very reliable. People love it. Um, people are used to it. And I think that matters. However, you know, I I'm looking at the Solana ecosystem here and I like these metrics. Like these are metrics that analysts like to look at in the background and they say, what are the like cornerstones of a thriving ecosystem and its active addresses, its volume, its activity, it's all these different things, right? 
transaction count. Um, and it just, to me, says that Solana is still heading in a nice direction. Um, and, and I like what I'm seeing over here. So I don't think that we're going to see Solana thip, you know, flip Ethereum anytime soon or anything like that. But what I'm saying is I still see it as relatively undervalued. I, I think it's hard to say that you don't see it as, as undervalued, even with the great performance that it's had, at least in comparison to things like Bitcoin and Ethereum. So long as it's outperforming them on, on a lot of these on-chain metrics, um, I think that it's worthy of more than a 3% market share. So, you know, full disclosure, I have exposure to Solana. I also have even more exposure to Bitcoin and Ethereum. So I'm not really arguing in my wallet here. If I was, it'd kind of be the opposite saying that <laughs> Ethereum and Bitcoin were going to outperform Solana. Um, but I'm just slowly coming to that realization that despite having more exposure to Bitcoin and Ethereum, Solana continues to look look better to me. Um, and I think that a lot of these metrics are evidence of that. So, you know, we have the full thing on screen here. Um, you know, you can kind of pause and read through this um, if you want to, to kind of go into more detail than just what we cover here. But the $24 billion in trading volume speaks for itself. And, uh, you know, it's, it's caused me to reevaluate some things here lately saying, okay, well, you know, do I want more exposure on, on this end or that end? And I think the other thing that this tells me, TiVo, is that there's always a trade to make in the crypto market, right? You know, we look at some of those altcoins that might've been heading down in recent weeks and recent months. Um, and then there's other ones like this. And, you know, you mentioned Maple a second ago, I think it did 130% move in like a two week period. Um, and then we looked at Radium and Jupiter and Solana, which have done, you know, 50, 60, 70% in the last couple of weeks. And so no matter really what stage of the market that we're in, there's always activities out there. So if you're one of those people and you're looking at your bags and you're going, you know, what am I doing wrong here? You know, all, all my things have been read for four months straight. Um, that doesn't have to be the scenario. And maybe this is your sign again, not legal or financial advice. But maybe this is your sign to return to your portfolios and to do a deep reevaluation of them. You know, look at your winners, look at your losers. And I think one of the most common mistakes that people make at this stage of the market is that they're selling their winners to accumulate more of their losers when it should be the opposite way around, right? They should be getting rid of the losers to add to the winners. But a lot of people double down on the losers because they think that it's overextended to the downside when in reality, they just continue to get outperformed for the rest of the market cycle. So that's kind of my two cents there. I don't know if you had any thoughts on that, TiVo, but. Yeah, I did yeah. actually. I had a specific thought on Solana kind of going back um, almost a year and a half ago uh, when, you know, we were in the depths of the bear market, FTX was going down. And, and I think, you know, you could make a case pretty easily that Solana was had one of the biggest black eyes in the space due to SBF and his links to Solana. And I, I remember, you know, at that time, I think the PR people for Solana really wanted to come on. I know we had Austin Federer on a couple of times and it made sense that they wanted to tell their story, you know, through their lens and, and not through uh, SBF's lens. And, and we've had great conversations with them. And I remember uh, Pizza Mind uh, went to, I believe he went to a Solana breakport or some type of Solana event. And he was shocked at how crowded it was with developers and people that were working on it. And then I know the next um, Solana conference, Austin invited us to was last year in Amsterdam. We couldn't make it. But uh, then you, you saw the footage out of that and just a, a really, really tight knit community of developers and people that believe in the tech. And obviously the investors are there as well to bring the price back up from, you know, what was it at the bottom? It was like six bucks or something. So I think that's that's an interesting story, too, is we, we get caught in these, oh, you know, four months and sideways. What are we going to do? We need that 30, 40 percent gainer. It's like, well, yeah, zoom out and, and you know, dive deep and listen to the storylines and do your own research. And, you know, I think we mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, too, is, you know, Solana was one of our picks last summer um, or around July 4th. And it's rocketed from there as well. So, you know, you. you you can always find winners in short time frames, but I wouldn't say it's necessarily easier, but you're going to find those more consistent big time winners over longer periods of time with the right research. Um, and that's what we try to do here. Yeah. And I think that's a great point because I'll admit I was a skeptic after all the, the Alameda and FTX and all that stuff. I was a true believer. I was like, I don't know if Solana can recover from here. And I wasn't accumulating around, you know, at the bottom of it. 
it wasn't until we had them on and they were explaining what they're doing. And I actually looked into the evidence of all that and saw what was happening in the background that I was convinced. You know, we are talking to more people. They're like, you got to see Solana has this great activity. They're continuing the build. They're not dead. Like, look at the stuff that's happening. And it wasn't until someone told me that and I had to look at that myself and come to the realization and say, hey, I was wrong. And man, I'm so glad that I did. But maybe there's other people out there that are in the same spot. Um, maybe they're uh, married to a coin or they're avidly against a coin and they're not willing to make the flip to say, hey, I'm wrong about this coin or the opposite. Um, and say, you know, maybe, hey, maybe I need to get rid of this or, hey, maybe I need to go ahead and get that um, because I think that there are people that are probably in the same boat and there's nothing wrong with it. Right. Sometimes you got to take a little bit of a hit to the chin, a hit to the ego, but it's worth it. Um, so anyway, as we continue to see that there's a lot of opportunity out there clearly, and there's going to be a lot of other crypto projects just like, you know, where Solana was a year, year and a half ago. Um, but I'll tell you what, Tiva, let's go ahead and move on and talk about these Ethereum ETFs. Cause this is, you know, one of the most requested things that we get over here is, is people really just bringing this up saying, Hey, what in the world is going on with this thing? You know, they've been out for, you know, give or take a week or two now. And, uh, we want to know what's happening. And when it comes to these, you know, I, we referenced outflows. We're going to talk about that in a second, but on the screen, uh, here, I have a chart that shows us what the Ethereum outflows look like for these spot ETFs that were just approved from all of these different TradFi managers. Now, the one thing that you'll note is that there is a single source that has been contributing quite a bit of outflows, and that would be Grayscale. Now, <laughs> you might remember that we had a very similar conversation towards the beginning of the year when Grayscale was having tremendous amounts of Bitcoin spot ETF outflows. Um, there was about a two-week period where the price of Bitcoin dumped a little over 20%. And they were seeing about, you know, three, four, five, some days even $600 million in outflows uh, per day. Well, when the Ethereum ETFs came out, you know, just a week or two ago, uh, we have started to see the same thing. So on this chart, you can see that the blue is the negative outflows over here, and all the other ones are positive. So there is one main contributor here that is doing most of the outflows, not all, but most. But you can see that just about every other Ethereum spot ETF is seeing inflows, um, inflows of 500, inflows of 170, 180, 200, um, $100 million on a pretty consistent basis. But then there's the outflows. And this is what we're seeing where it's seeing, you know, negative uh, 463 million in outflows. Minus 300, minus 330, minus 350, minus 200, minus 120. And this is coming from Grayscale. Now, this, <laughs> as much as this is unfortunate, it's not anything new. And it's not anything that we haven't already talked about on here. You know, if you are a routine listener um, of the Crypto Rundown, then you would know that we have talked about this several times over the last couple of months. Um, in fact, we are going to roll a clip for all of you where we were talking about this exact subject just a few weeks ago. But if we look at what happened to Bitcoin kind of during this same period here, then we can see that right after the Bitcoin ETFs got approved, and I'm going to remove this watermark real fast, but right after the Bitcoin ETF got approved, it saw a pullback right here from around 40K or 50K, excuse me, down to 38K. Short little pullback, a few weeks of downwards movement. But what happened in about the, the two months after this was a 92% rally in the price of Bitcoin to a new all-time high. So now I'm looking at the Ethereum ETF here and saying, hmm, you know, are we going to see something similar where we get an initial sell-off, an initial pullback, maybe some short-term downside? Mm -hmm. But what's going to happen a month from now? What's going to happen six months from now? What's going to happen a year from now? Because we've seen what happens once the initial people who want to sell, the initial people who want to get out of Grayscale and these other things, and they want to take their profits, once they're done, the inflows continued with Bitcoin. And that's what led to this, this giant rally. Nostradamus over there. You know, Tiva, that's the great thing about the crypto markets is that you can look at past data, you can look at similar events, and we can get an understanding of what could happen 
And this is just another one of ex of those examples. You know, we don't have a crystal ball. We certainly can't predict the future, the hundred percent certainty, or anything like that. Um, but there's a strong correlation in these events, right? We saw what Grayscale did with the Bitcoin ETFs, and <laughs> It's only reasonable to believe that they would probably behave in a similar manner for the Ethereum ETFs. And that's exactly what we see playing out right now. You know, we go and we look at the chart over here and we are pulling back kind of since these things happen. It's been really volatile. But just in the same way that we saw the Bitcoin outflows, we're seeing the Ethereum outflows. And the same way that Bitcoin didn't skyrocket to new all time highs within the first few weeks of the ETFs trading. Ethereum's not doing that either. We're seeing choppiness. We're seeing some downwards price movement. And the truth is, you know, we can see a little bit more of this. But as you saw from that clip of us talking about this, in the months following the Bitcoin ETF, um, prices went bananas. And this is when Bitcoin hit its new all-time high. In the two, three months following the Bitcoin ETFs going live and beginning trading, not in the weeks following, but in the months following. And so as we're looking at the Ethereum situation over here, and as this thing has been kind of retracing since the ETFs came out for the most part, again, I'm not concerned with what happens this week, next week. I'm concerned about what's going to happen two to three months from now, even heck a year from now, because just like Bitcoin hit a new all-time high, I think that Ethereum can too. In the very least, I think that it can easily hit a new cycle high. You know, one of the big things to kind of pay attention to here is... When are these Ethereum ETF outflows going to dry up? And I believe the block also, or someone had another report. I was talking about this last Friday. Um, but basically, they can't continue at the rate that they have been issuing outflows or that, that they've been having outflows. They can't continue at that rate or else they will be out of Ethereum within a matter of weeks. They do not have enough reserves to continue selling off three to $400 million of Ethereum a day. They just don't. They will qu very quickly run out. And we saw that once Grayscale um, lost about half of their Bitcoin under management, that's when the outflows drastically slowed down. So, you know, just like we've said pre previously, the people who are wanna, going to want to sell, they will sell. Um, and Grayscale is already being more proactive with these Ethereum spot ETFs than they were with the Bitcoin ones because they're starting a second one, their mini ETF for Ethereum that is going to have a tenth of the fees. So they're going to go from a 2.5% um, fee structure to a 0.25% fee structure. And I think that they've even cut that in recent weeks to be lower than that. Um, I've seen some stuff floating around that or floating around um, that are referencing that. So maybe they're going to be below a 0.25, below a, a 0.2. I've seen people talking about like a 0.15 or something like that. And if that's the case, that will incentivize people to stay. So basically, you know, the, the big takeaway here is, hey, this is nothing that we haven't seen before. We know what happened last time. We know what happened before the ETFs. We know what happened during the ETFs. We know what happened after the ETFs. And that's why I'm really not all that concerned with some of the stuff that I'm seeing. Uh, now, TiVo, I know that you had a an update kind of in regards to all the stuff that was happening with Grayscale. So I want to pass it off to you. Yeah, for sure. If I could just share my screen real quick, I'll pull up uh, pull up a tweet. Just similar while we're talking Grayscale, thought it'd be good to note to the listeners just in case you know they're not checking every day at their portfolio. Uh, if you do hold uh, GBTC, you notice that there was a sharp sell off the other day. And um, this is from our guy James Safart, keeping us uh, up to date. So that that ten percent dive was the spin off of the GPTC mini trust. So they did the same thing uh, with with uh, BTC, they did a spin off into this quote unquote mini trust that has lower fees to try to attract more inflows into that fund. And uh, I don't know, for lack of a better words, they're kind of holding people hostage uh, with the higher fees. Uh, and everybody kind of has to decide, you know, is it worth selling to then pay the taxes on your long term holdings of ETH and, and BTC? Um, to then, you know, maybe transfer to a different fund, take the cash, uh, whatever you want to do with it, or you're going to not pay, you don't want to pay the taxes yet. You want a long-term hold, but you're going to deal with this higher fee and their flagship funds. So if you do log on, it's basically like a, um, I, I don't know, it's, it's not a stock split, um, or a spin off Like when a, when a company, I know G's done this recently, 
uh, with GE Vernova and GE Aerospace is, you know, if you held GE and then they split, you get shares of all these new entities. So if you notice that your GBTC took a sell off, make sure you, you scroll your portfolio and look for the new uh, shares of the GPTC mini trust that you got. Yeah, that's right, Tivo. Thanks for keeping us up to date with all of that. I think it's really great info. I mean, clearly, clearly there's a lot happening behind the scenes. Um, but one of the big things that has happened in the last week here was the Bitcoin 2024 conference in Nashville. Uh, this thing had a stacked leaderboard of guests and analysts and speakers. And uh, one of the big takeaways was from the presidential candidate and former president Donald Trump talking about his stance on Bitcoin. And we've known that he's been a little bit more of the pro Bitcoin side. He's been fighting for crypto. Um, but this really reaffirmed that. And he had some cool statements. He talked about a bunch of cool stuff. Uh, I don't want to speak for him. In fact, we got some clips that we want to show all of you that kind of just highlight uh, some of the stuff that he said. So let's roll the clips. Good afternoon, I'm laying out my plan to ensure that the United States will be the crypto capital of the planet and the Bitcoin superpower of the world. And we'll get it done. If crypto is going to define the future, I want to be mined, minted, and made in the USA, it's going to be. It's not going to be made anywhere else. And if Bitcoin is going to the moon, as we say, it's going to the moon. I want America to be the nation that leads the way. And that's what's going to happen. On day one, I will fire Gary Gensler and appoint a new SEC chairman. I didn't know he was that unpopular. <laughs> Let me say it again. <laughs> On day one, I will fire Gary Gensler. Whoa. I will appoint a new SEC chairman who believes America should build the future, not block the future, which is what they're doing. So strong words there. Um, as you could tell, the Bitcoin crowd was quite <laughs> riled up over the Gary Gensler quote. Um, definitely his loudest pop of the speech. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's 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 uh, I feel like I say this every time we try not to get political, but the political sphere has totally morphed in with the crypto sphere uh, this election season, which I think is positive for the space. And so you can't deny it. There were I mean, there was everybody, like you said, RFK, um, Trump, some other uh, other senators, congressmen. And there was even reports early in the week that Kamala's team reached out to the Bitcoin conference Um you know, the people that put that on and inquired maybe about a speaking spot or at least uh, Kamala is reaching out to some crypto uh, companies to, quote unquote, reset the relationship, uh, which, again, no matter what side of the political spectrum you are, if you're on the crypto spectrum, uh, any rhetoric around that would be positive. But this this Trump speech, you know, 100 days before an election at a Bitcoin conference is pretty wild. Yeah, I mean, there's... <sighs> People want to see this space grow, and that's what they want to hear. People are tired of what Gary has done and how regulation has been and how it's been so unclear and it's been oppressed. And then there's been lawsuits against all these different projects and companies, even Coinbase and Kraken, which are supposed to be regulated. And people are tired of it all. People want clarity and they want to see this space grow. And so I think the biggest takeaways for me were him saying, this the, the future of this space shouldn't be overseas. It should be with us. And I could not agree more with that. If it doesn't happen in the US, it's going to happen somewhere else. And people want to see the crypto economy boom here. You know, especially all of us in the States, we want to see it boom here in the States. Um, so I like that. A, a couple of the other things that stood out to me were him talking about how Bitcoin can one day potentially pass gold in terms of of market capitalization. And that's a big deal. Gold is, I think, a $16 trillion um, asset class at the moment, so, something like a $16 trillion market cap. 
He's talking about how he wants to send crypto to new halt to new highs like they've never seen before. Um, that's something that I think is hard to guarantee, but it's good to incentivize and say, hey, I want to put position or I want to put crypto in a position where it can see that growth. I think that's something that he can say. Um, and I don't think any kind of crypto holder is going to want to argue against that. But there's a lot of other great stuff too. You know, the prevention of a CBDC, which is a central bank digital currency. I think that would be good. Um, and the other final thing that I thought was just kind of cool is that he like almost kind of knows crypto lingo, but he doesn't fully know it. So he'll make like <clears throat> these claims and say like, oh, crypto will go to the moon or never sell your Bitcoin, kind of like a HODL reference. And then there's these little things like that um, that would get people people riled up. So it's kind of cool to see that he's been doing his research to at least know like slang and what gets the crypto markets and the crypto people riled up. The big one was what you mentioned, Gary Gensler being like, on day one, I'm going to fire Gary Gensler. And the crowd just goes bananas. Like that's the thing that I think that they loved more than anything else, more than saying that Bitcoin can have a $16 trillion market cap, uh, is saying that he's going to get rid of Gary and everyone's like, yeah, get him out of here. And I know you yeah, like was, that, you know? Yeah. Oh yeah. I'm, uh, it made for some good internet, uh, <laughs> internet memes and internet oh, posts yeah. all weekend long. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, I think it's cool to know that there's a team around this presidential camp that is getting into the space more than maybe Trump himself, because, uh, you know, he, he even wove in like some of his traditional speech parts uh, during that speech, you know, talking true political talking points that have been talked about for the last 50 years. And like the crowd was quiet, especially in the beginning. If he was talking about other issues, like everybody's just like, okay, dude, like that's not why we're here. And then just like, we'll yeah. fire Gary Gensler. Crowd goes wild. And he, yeah. you, you kind of <laughs> see, he's like a comedian. He's literally like a comedian. Like, okay, this bit's working like good. Let's stick with yeah. this. So, um, yeah, it, it was, it was fun to see. Uh, he's obviously quite, quite the, the, the uh, charismatic guy to, to give a Bitcoin speech, but I thought RFK had some cool points as he always does. And just, uh, I thought there was a lot of coverage around it, obviously because Trump was speaking, but, um, yeah, I don't know that I think Michael Saylor, uh, had some interviews with CNBC and Fox business while he was there. Um, you know, Scott Melker did a good job. Uh, Natalie Brunel did a good job. Just a lot, a lot of content coming out from it. There seemed to be a lot of momentum there, which is awesome. Yeah, I agree. It's just great to see the crypto space grow and that it is in a position now where it's being talked about like this. Like we didn't see this in previous election cycles. We've really never seen this before. We're like, this is a mainstream campaign point. Like they understand how big this industry is. I mean, we're talking... I mean, what's the total market cap of, of the entire crypto market at the moment? I'm pulling it up. I think we're over a $2.3 trillion market cap. That's a big industry. It's a really big industry. And I think they recognize that now there's now just millions and millions of people that are plugged into this. There are what I would imagine to be thousands, if not tens or hundreds of thousands of jobs employed by this you know, now multi-trillion dollar industry. And it's a big point. So the crypto space has come a long way. And uh, again, people yeah. are just hungry for positive regulation. For sure. And we've shared this before, but we were talking about gold as like a $16 trillion asset class. So this is top asset classes by market cap. And this is my favorite chart to share with friends, family, or people that I talk to. Uh, that you know have no interest in Bitcoin, not even necessarily negative on it, just don't have any interest. Like, oh yeah, the internet money, whatever. Like, w when you show them this chart, be like, hey, let's let's name the biggest assets in the world. We'll start with gold, Apple, Microsoft, Nvidia, Alphabet, Amazon, you know, Saudi America, silver, and then you kind of ask me, like, hey, can you guess guess what nine and ten is? I think a lot of people say Meta, and then they'll name some other companies, right? And then I'll be like, what if I told you Bitcoin was number nine? And, and people just, they're like, that's, that's not real. That can't be real. And I, I always think that that's a fun one to show of like, I mean, this thing is, is the real deal right now. And, and with the big boys and that was even kind of before, you know, it was obviously in the top 25, top 50 before there was political, uh, you know, almost pandering now to it. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I think that's something to consider of like, it's, it's up there now. So where, where can it go if it, if it really starts to get mass adoption? Yeah. I mean, I agree. When you kind of put it in perspective like that and you're like, oh, it's bigger than Meta. It's bigger than Tesla already. It's getting close to being bigger than silver. I think that gives 
quite the perspective to a lot of people. Um, and there's still people out there. And, you know, ironically enough, about a month or two ago, I was talking to someone who's like, what gives this thing value? You know, what makes this, you know, not just a giant Ponzi scheme? Because that's what I think it is. And I said, well, you have to understand here that, and a lot of the times this does come from a lack of understanding, but you have to understand that the biggest asset managers on the planet, we're talking BlackRock, Fidelity, Van Eck, Franklin Templeton, all these big mainstream TradFi institutions, they're all in on this. We're now talking about the United States government, which has the largest economy in the world, potentially having a Bitcoin reserve. Then on top of this, you have the Bitcoin network, which has millions and, and just millions of users and transactions and a trillion dollars in market cap. And it all secures a network that for the past like 15 years has never once gone offline and continually been operational and upgraded and all these things. And that's what gives it intrinsic value is the fact that you have this globally decentralized, secure network that has been fully operational and functioning. And on top of just what's happening in its decentralized space and those metrics, you now have centralized contributors saying we support this as well, potentially the US government moving forward. But we also have from some of the biggest traditional asset managers on the planet whose sole job is to work in the finance and money space, make more money, manage it effectively, and look at what the future of finance looks like. And they're offering these products. So whenever anyone kind of tries to make this argument as to what gives this value, all of that gives it value. In fact, that has more value than the vast majority of other things that you can compare it to. You know, what other thing has accomplished all of those, right? You know, most stocks haven't even accomplished half of what we just listed, you know, let alone you know, a crypto doing it. So I think that there's a lot of value here. I think the TradFi players see it. The average person is starting to see it. Politicians are starting to see it. And uh, the future is looking bright to you, though. Yeah, and I, I think part of the education process is there's always people that want to question things. And I, I think those can be the smartest people. I really like exploring, you know, different things, whether it's space or money or you know, geopolitics, the history of war, whatever. And asking questions is great, but the people that love to throw stones at Bitcoin might not be the most educated on their own financial system. And, you know, we live in a great country and, and I love America. America's number one. Um, but, you know, we're, we're with our faults and, you know, studying, you know, the Federal Reserve and, and inflation and money printing and how that all matches up with the, you know, the, the average rate of, uh, you know, increase of GDP is like, it's not, it's not a coincidence. And, and, you know, it's all, it's all trying to figure out how to play this game that we call life and, you know, different exposure to different things over time has, has shown to help. I would agree. Well, the tech space is constantly evolving. We believe that the crypto markets are at the forefront of it. You know, clearly a lot of other people believe that as well, but man, we appreciate everyone tuning in here. There's a lot of great stuff that's going on and we love bringing it all to you. So all that we ask over here is that if you like these crypto market rundowns and us kind of bringing all the news to you uh, and handing it to you, all that we ask here is that you hit the like button, you hit the subscribe button, maybe leave us a review. You know, we have people coming in from all over, all over the world, all over these different platforms from YouTube to Spotify to Apple Podcasts to Audible and all this stuff. And a quick reminder on that front is that if you want to get all the visuals that we're talking about, we're constantly throwing up charts and articles and screenshots and all this stuff. Um, if you want all that, go over to the YouTube. That's where all the videos sit and it's completely free. So we appreciate everyone coming on here today. Thank you all for tuning in and we're gonna see all of you at the same time, same place next week.